Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash ham nation. And by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 180, January 21st, 2015. Where there's smoke, there's ham. Hey, it's Wednesday night, and it's Ham Nation night. Good evening. I'm Don, AE5DW, down in uh, Mississippi. We've got your your standard uh, uh, cast of... uh, uh, what, what should we call ourselves? The usual suspects, <laughs> for the most part tonight. Let's let's head up uh, a couple of uh, a couple of hours to my north to Jackson, Mississippi, where, by the way, there's an excellent ham fest this Saturday. Uh, the Jackson Ham Fest in Jackson, Mississippi. Look it up online. Uh, George, how are you doing tonight, sir? I am doing fine, Don. You know, we've had a nice couple of days here. The temperature has warmed up a little bit. Looking forward to the ham fest this weekend and seeing you there, of course as well as all our other friends. And, well, we've really got a jam-packed show tonight. But we did manage to get Bob in here for just a few minutes. Hi, Bob. Hi, George, Don, and everybody. I, uh, I'm i just up the road from uh, uh, that character uh, Gordon West uh, place. In fact, we passed real close there a while ago. We're in uh, Anaheim, uh, just a couple of blocks from the Los Angeles, or I guess it's Anaheim Convention Center. We're here for the NAM show, the National Association of Music Merchants. So it's a big deal. Uh, there'll, there'll be over 100,000 guitar players and piccolo players and audio guys. It's it's a big deal. And uh, I've been coming to it since 1959. That was my first year. I, I worked for Hammond Organ as a demonstrator in their booth. But uh, it's a little bit different the last uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, we're, uh, of course, a vendor. But uh, really good to check in. I'll be here for just a little bit, but sure glad that we could do that. I got to see uh, everybody at Quartz Fest. That was really great so i hope that uh hope that the recording comes out okay and greetings to the chat room everybody there and uh we'll be back next week on our regular regular schedule from good old uh uh missouri and uh, we'll see what happens so i guess don you pick it up and uh, thanks a lot for having me in here for just a few well, of course. I mean, you're an honored guest when you're not driving the bus. So, yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> well, we mentioned Quartz Fest, and of course, Gordon and Randy and uh, several hundred other hams have have uh, converged on Quartzsite, Arizona for Quartz Fest. And we went to them a little bit earlier, and they couldn't really hear us. They thought we were live because we're running a little bit late tonight. But we did get that recorded. So, uh, Victor, who is uh, the real bus driver tonight, if you can pull that up. And we'll join those guys uh, live on tape, more or less, from Quartz Fest. All right. Uh, well, we're here live, uh, live and direct at uh, Quartz Fest uh, 2015. This is Chris's fifth year of rolling it, and thanks to the Ham Nation chat room, you said you got to have a ham that's burning. So let me check with the hams here. Did you want a ham that was burning? Over. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got Leo LaPorte. We've got Ham Nation viewers rolling. And uh, we are live from Quartz Fest, Arizona, where all the hams in the know are now toasting themselves and roasting themselves here at Quartz Fest. All right. uh, Back to Randy and his team. Okay. (laughs) So it's flaming away. Great. It's really burning. We got, uh, what, four HTs on here tonight? It's, uh, it's really burning. And keep her going. Keep her going. <laughs> what else to say? I don't know. It's been a great, this is my first time at the uh, Quartz Fest and uh, went on a four wheel drive uh, off road today. And uh oh, gonna really torch off the HDs here. That's it. <laughs> Dump it on there. Let her go. There it goes. That's a real hot radio. <laughs> Burning great. Sure. 
And, you know, I've got to say the best part of Quartz Fest is it's not just a one burning man show, but it's a team effort to pull this off. Right now, we've got the wind blowing about 30 to 35 miles an hour. Embers are going all the way to uh, Yuma. Uh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but, you know, as hams, we have our obligatory fire extinguisher. Of course, it's out of juice, but uh, nonetheless, it looks good. So, again, everybody on the count of three, let's just say ham nation so they'll never forget us and the burning man. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> there we go. That's great. Matt, did, did they act did they actually burn handy talkies on that thing? Were those were those actual handy talkies that I, I, I hope I hope they weren't icons. They had to have been the little Chinese guys, I hope. I like, Don, I, 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 I was thinking the same thing, Don. We we don't want to mention what they burned. That might not no. be. But they said there were they, they said there were HTs on there, and I'm thinking, oh my God, they're 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 burning radios. That's that's scary. Well, that that's great. I'm I'm glad they're having a good time. I'm gonna have to make that make that trip one of these times. But if you're into primitive camping and ham radio, then man, that's Quartz Fest is uh, is the place to be. They've got a really active Facebook page too, and, and a nice website. So uh, search for that for next year. For Quartz Fest, I mentioned the Jackson Ham Fest. Jackson, Mississippi Ham Fest is uh, this weekend, and uh, George is going to be there. And I'm planning on making the drive up unless something catastrophic happens. So, uh, if you're uh, a fan of Ham Nation, uh, try to make it, and you're around the Jackson, Mississippi area. Come on up and join us. We uh, we're going to have a good time. Right now, I want to talk about one of our sponsors, and it's a, it's a sponsor that's near and dear to my heart. It's Audible.com. This is a great audiobook service. And what I like about Audible is I have a long commute. My commute is 125 miles round trip. So I spend about two and a half hours, uh, give or take, driving every day. And so Audible is like a lifesaver to me. They are the leading provider of audiobooks. More than 150 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, periodicals. And for listeners of Ham Nation, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out the service. Now, one you might consider... Is actually a movie that is out right now, and and uh, Victor, if you'll bring up that page, that's the one right there, Unbroken. That is the story of Louis Zamperini, who actually, uh, at the age of, I think, 94, just passed away a few months ago. He passed away before the movie came out. Uh, I believe Christmas Day it was released, but it's an amazing story of an amazing man who was an Olympic athlete and, uh, and enlisted in the Army and uh, the, pl the plane he was in went down in the ocean and he spent like... I want to say months, he and three other sailors uh, spent, or, or aviators, spent months in a life raft, literally months, like 50-something days in a life raft. And all of a sudden, a ship comes along, and I think, oh, we're rescued, and it's the Japanese. And then it actually got worse from there. He survived all that, uh, came back, and like I say, he, he lived to be nearly 100 years old, and it's an awesome movie. And in fact, I have... Uh, come to me, uh, Victor. Let me show you something here. I have my iPad, and you can listen to this on several different platforms. I have it here on on my iPad, and it looks great. It works really, really good on the on the iPhone as well, or, or just about anything. But let me give you a little sample of it here. Listen to this. All he could see in every direction was water. It was June twenty third, nineteen forty three. Somewhere on the endless expanse of the Pacific Ocean. Army Air Force's bombardier and Olympic runner, Louis Zamperini, lay across a small raft, drifting westward. Slumped alongside him was a sergeant, one of his plane's gunners. Just an amazing story, and uh, of course that's Edward Herman, who is doing the narration, and, and a great actor and voice actor in his own right, and he just passed away as well. So uh, a couple of good reasons, besides the story, I think, to, uh, to listen to, to this book. It's a great book, and if you want to download... This audiobook for free or any other one of your choice of the over 150,000 downloadable titles, go to audiblepodcast.com slash ham nation. That's audiblepodcast.com slash ham nation. It's a great thing, and I think you'll you'll really enjoy it, and it's it's become a big part of my life. So, Audible, we thank you so much for your support of Ham Nation. Thank you, Audible. And right now, let's uh, continue on with the news of the week from Amateur Radio Newsline. And I have some information that, that you'll find interesting as well. So let's roll the Newsline package. 
From Amateur Radio Newsline, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, January 21st, 2015. Ten years of work within the ARRL Michigan section have culminated in an amateur radio antenna bill that mirrors the reasonable accommodation provisions of the PRB1 federal preemption policy. Michigan Governor Rick Snyder signed Senate Bill 0493 into law January 15th, creating Public Act 556. Senator Rick Jones sponsored the bill. ARRL Michigan Section Manager Larry Camp, WB8R, said Michigan is the 31st state to have a PRB1 bill on its books. He continued with, the current PRB1 team has been working for three years to get this accomplished. Our bill endured four votes on its way to becoming law, Senate and House committees and the Senate and House floors. Each vote was unanimous. The most pertinent language of the new Michigan law, which comes directly from Part 97.15 of the FCC Amateur Rules, states, An amateur radio service station antenna structure may be erected at heights and dimensions sufficient to accommodate amateur radio service communications. Regulations of an amateur radio service station antenna structure by a local unit of government must not preclude amateur radio service communications. Rather, it must reasonably accommodate those communications and must constitute the minimum practicable regulation to accomplish the local unit of government's legitimate purpose. The new law also provides for an advisory committee that may be established jointly by the Michigan Section and other state organizations, such as the Michigan Municipal League and the Michigan Township Association. The sun emitted its first big solar flare of 2015, an M-class flare that peaked at 11.24 p.m. Eastern on January 12th. Here's more from Dr. Tamitha Scove. The sun has gotten quite busy in the past couple days, beginning with this filament eruption that happened just east of center sun on the 12th, and that launched a partially Earth-directed solar ejection. Also, you see region 2257, it's been lighting off M flares just before it rotates behind the west limb. And we're going to be monitoring that region very closely as it transits the backside over the next two weeks. Region 2257 is rotating off into the west limb right now, so NOAA will be lowering uh, the M flare risk from about 40% down to about 30% over the next few days as that region rotates out of view. The FCC continues its crackdown on rules violations around 14.313. The FCC Enforcement Bureau has affirmed an $11,500 fine against Brian Crow, K3VR of North Huntington, Pennsylvania, for deliberately interfering with other amateur radio communications. The FCC had first proposed the fine last July, and it released a forfeiture order on January 13th. The FCC said it imposed the financial penalty because of Crow's willful and repeated violation of Section 333 of the Communications Act and of Sections 97.101D and 97.119A of the Amateur Service Rules by causing intentional interference to licensed radio operations and failing to transmit his assigned call sign. On July 22, 2014, the FCC also issued a similarly worded NAL to Michael Guernsey, KZ8O of Parchment, Michigan, proposing to fine him $22,000. In both cases, the FCC said the evidence indicated that the transmissions at issue were aimed at interfering with other radio amateurs with whom each licensee had a long-standing and well-documented dispute that had spilled out onto the air. The Enforcement Bureau had warned both Guernsey and Crow in the past regarding interference to other amateur radio operators. In Crow's case, the FCC said the fact that he subsequently interfered with other amateur operators demonstrates a deliberate disregard for the Commission's authority, warning an upward adjustment of $3,500 to his proposal proposed base forfeiture. Guernsey's case is still pending. The VK3YT balloon keeps going and going and going. After being launched from Melbourne, Australia on December 27th, the small balloon has been tracked easterly to the southern tip of New Zealand, traveled across the Pacific and South America, and over the southern Atlantic Ocean to Namibia on the west coast of Africa. As previously reported, Andy Nguyen, VK3YT, who launched the small solar-powered strong foil party-type balloon, says it spent many days wandering off the African coast before floating over land. Very earlier balloon flights have lasted from a matter of hours up to several days. Some reached Tasmania, Queensland, New Zealand, and Brazil in South America. This is the longest flight so far, and it's continuing. And finally, an update on the status of Amateur Radio Newsline. Bill Pasternak is still hospitalized, but we're well on our way to having our weekly audio reports back in operation. Skeeter Nash, N5ASH, will be spearheading that effort, and we hope to be back in at least a limited capacity very soon. Our sincere thanks to all who have posted words of kindness and encouragement for Bill on our Facebook page. It means a great deal to him and a great deal to all of us as well. And that's all from the Amateur Radio News Line, your independent source for amateur radio news brought to you each and every week for over 37 years and counting at www.arnewsline.org. For Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF, and Dr. Tamitha Scove, I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW, 73. 
We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. And it's nice to have Dr. Scove be part of the uh, a part of the Newsline team now. She's not a ham yet, but I'm working on her, and uh, she's excited. So uh, thank you, Tamitha, uh, Dr. Scove. We we do appreciate it. And uh, of course, we mentioned that Skeeter is working on getting Newsline uh, the audio portion back up, and that actually we may have a newscast coming up for release on Friday. We're working on it. I recorded something for Skeeter this morning uh, before I left for work, and uh, he is hard at work. And uh, Skeeter Nash in five ash we. Appreciate your efforts, that's for sure. But I do have some late breaking news here. Let me uh, let me give you the, this is uh, this is uh, if you're going to Dayton, you know we mentioned Hamfest a minute ago. Department of Homeland Security's Office of Emergency Communications will offer its Auxiliary Communications course or Oxcom course May 12th through 14th, just prior to uh, Hamvention in Dayton. Uh, details for registration on the course you'll find at Hamvention.org beginning uh, the first of February. And uh, it's a three-day course, provides uh, facilitated lectures, student exercises, interactive discussions on auxiliary communications, designed for auxiliary emergency communicators who uh, volunteer to provide backup emergency radio communications to support public safety and emergency response professionals and their agencies. Sounds like ham radio, doesn't it? Sure does. Uh, you want to find out more uh, about the, uh, uh, what the, the contributions of uh, these volunteers, including hams, uh, are being discussed in the 2014 edition of the National Emergency Communications Plan, you can find that at uh, publicsafetytools.info. So the Oxcom course is coming to Dayton, and uh, that's a good thing if uh, if you're into emergency communications. And, of course, uh, why wouldn't you be? So there you go. That's uh, the news from Newsline. And uh, Bill continues to get a little bit better day by day. He's not, uh, not going to be released from the hospital quite yet, but he's trying, and we're trying, and we appreciate your support. George, I think it's time we maybe look at a little smoke and solder action. That sounds good, Don. And uh, let me first say, uh, Bill, uh, speedy recovery there. And it's good to see Skeeter picking up uh, some of the duties in assembling the um, amateur radio newsline audio. I was going to say podcast, but it's not really a podcast. Well, is it, it is. It, it is as well. It's available as a podcast. But yeah, it's uh, it's uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, anyway, it was great to uh, hear that Skeeter's picking that up because Bill could use a break every now and then, and to have somebody who's, you know, willing to take that on and assemble it, I'm sure it will be a help to him. Well, I just want to mention one thing before we go on, and this is for our friends down south, farther south than us, Don. Uh, ICOM is going to be sponsoring Contest University Caribbean uh, January 23rd and 25th. That's this weekend in Hatillo, Puerto Rico. And it's during the ARRL um Puerto Rico State Convention down there. So uh, our friends down south make plans to attend that because it's the first time Contest University has been in that area. And they're going to have a lot of good speakers there as well. Well, you know, this week we're going to play an oldie but a goodie. Uh, the reason why is, you know, I I, uh, I still do a little broadcast work just for uh, one little AM station on the side these days. And he's got a solid state 10 kW transmitter. And boy, those things are really nice until they quit. <laughs> and then they're a lot harder to troubleshoot than, say, a, a tube-type transmitter would be. But anyway, I finally found the problem. I had a couple of these bridge rectifiers go bad, so got those on order, and I'll be getting him straightened out soon. He's still on the air. But that took up a lot of my time this week. So we're going to take a look, as I said, an oldie but goodie on some weird ways that different products are powered. What does a toy boat, a wind-up radio, and an electric toothbrush have in common? Sometimes I like to open up things and see what makes them tick. And today, I picked out three little electronic items here that are a bit strange in the way that they receive their power. I thought we'd have a look at each uh, to see what makes them tick. First, let's take a quick look at this Braun Oral-B electric toothbrush. Now, I've got to admit, this one uh, threw me for a loop at first. I had to think about it quite a while before I figured out how they were charging the battery in this device. I believe it has a nickel metal hydride battery in it, uh, which is pretty standard. But uh, if you look at the bottom of the toothbrush, there's a little uh, hole here, and that fits over a little post down here on the charging base. Now, what's strange about this is everything's insulated. There's no metal contacts anywhere here on either the uh, toothbrush 
or on the charging post. So how are they getting electricity out of here into the toothbrush to charge it? A, hidden contacts, although it doesn't appear that there's anything there. B, capacitive coupling. C, inductive coupling. Or D, magic. While you're thinking about that, we'll look at the other two items. I bought this at a local drugstore one day for about uh, $10 because I didn't have one and I wanted a wind-up radio. Well, you can run it off batteries if you like. It has a battery compartment for a couple of double A's. Or it's got a handy uh, wind-up generator here that you can charge it with. Simply turn the crank to make your own electricity. Now what I found interesting about this is that uh, it keeps playing after you stop cranking. So where is the electricity going? I mean, there are no batteries in here. Where is it coming from or how is it being stored? Also, um, just as an aside here, what about alternator noise? We'll flip it to AM. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> so, how's this thing holding a charge? Well, let's open it and see. Well, how about that? It does have batteries. And there it is, a pair of AAA 300 milliampere hours. So the little hand crank uh, merely charges up the uh, what looks to be a NICAD battery pack. Well, we know that in practice, uh, NICADs are probably not made for a, a duty cycle and charge cycle like this, but it'll last for a little while. Not the best radio I ever had. Now let's look at the toy boat. This one is pretty weird indeed. There's a little battery pack. You put about, uh, it's either six or eight uh, AA cells in here. And it's got a little plug. You plug it into the back of the boat. You push a little button on the battery box. The LED lights. And after a period of time, say uh, 60 seconds or so, the LED goes out and then the boat is charged and ready to run. So uh, how's this working? Are there uh, a pair of NICADs in this uh, boat that are being charged? Well, let's have a look. There's water. <laughs> Well, I don't see a battery pack, but what I do see is two electrolytic capacitors. So apparently the uh, battery voltage just charges up these two electrolytics and then that's what runs the boat. And now back to our mystery item, the Braun toothbrush. How are they getting a charging voltage from the charging stand into the toothbrush? Well, our choices were A, hidden contacts, although it doesn't appear that there's anything there. B, capacitive coupling. C, inductive coupling. Or D, magic. First, let's uh, look for hidden contacts. We'll bring in our uh, trusty voltmeter. Touching all the way around, and I don't see any hint of a fluctuation on the meter at all. So I'm saying no. There are no hidden contacts there. B, capacitive coupling. Well, I don't know exactly uh, how you would get a capacitor big enough uh, in the microfarad or farad range to charge a toothbrush. Uh, I don't think you could fit it in something this small. 
C. Inductive coupling. Well, uh, that would be like a, uh, a transformer is inductive. And it took me a while to think of this uh, as possibly being the solution and then how to prove it. So the first thing I did, I said if it's inductive, that possibly is magnetic. But uh, that didn't seem to be the case. It wouldn't uh, hold a paper clip. So if it's uh, inductive and that's like a transformer, I just happen to have a handy coil of wire and both ends are available. I have no idea what this came out of. It's possibly a speaker crossover, an old solenoid. Uh, I, I just have no idea. I've had it for years and years. So anyway, we'll just slide it down on the post. Now we'll take our voltmeter and we'll touch the two ends of the wire. Approximately 25 volts AC coming out of this coil. So there's the answer. C. Inductive coupling. This is actually a transformer. Half of the transformer is in the charging base and the other half is in the bottom of the toothbrush. And that's some of the weird ways that some things are powered. You know, it's uh, not always that obvious when you're looking at something from the outside. Sometimes you just got to tear into it and see what's going on. Well, you know, last week I asked a question, what was the first year that Quartz Fest was held? And I got an answer from Jason Miles, KE7IET, and he said the first Quartz Fest was held in 1997. That's correct, Jason. Congratulations, you're going to win this copy of QRP Projects from Down Under by Drew Diamond. VK3XY, or excuse me, XU. It's a great book, a, a lot of good projects in here. I've done a couple of them myself, at least one of them we've had on Ham Nation before. So uh, check out your ham radio vendor uh, that carries MFJ products, which practically all of them do. And as for this book right here, I guarantee you, you're going to like this. Now, for next week, we've got another question here. In that little uh, boat that we just saw there, capacitors were powering the unit. What's the official name for that type of capacitor? Uh, if you think you know that, send your answer to me at hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you might win this Heil USB key right here. It's a USB adapter uh, preamp with equalization. It's got uh, gain, uh, high and low equalization, as well as a volume for the little headphone jack here that's on the rear of it. A USB connector, plug it into your computer, plug the XLR connector here into the rear of your microphone, and you've got a USB device ready to go right there. High quality, uh, really helps out. I use these on the road uh, to for, for a lot of different things, but to remotely operate my rig or to do recording. So uh, hamnationcontest at gmail.com. Tell me what kind of capacitors those are. Well, right now, let's go to Val, and she's got a special guest with her tonight. Hi, Val. Well, hi, George. Hi, Don. Hi, Bob and Gordo and Randy and everybody out there. Hey, you know, I've been talking to everybody about uh, getting everybody excited about contesting. And one thing I wanted to show you was the benefits of contesting. I just got these in the mail from the Bureau. I'm guessing that's probably about 300 cards that I'm going to have to respond to. And... Uh, so get ready. Uh, your card guy is going to be busy once you start contesting. Well, tonight, yes, I do have a special guest. Uh, Vic, if you want to go ahead and show that first photo, and uh, let's see if anybody can guess who this is. How adorable. This is he, when he was operating back when he first got licensed at the age of 14. Now, he's currently a member of the CQDX Hall of Fame. He's chairman of Indexa, former chairman of the ARRO. RLDX Advisory Committee. And if you still don't know that who that is, he's also an avid contester and contest expeditioner. He set five single operator world records and competed in the WRTC in 1996 and 2000. And he's also participated in, led or co-led de-expeditions to 10 of the top 10 most wanted. And he's won 10 de-expedition of the year awards. He is the current president of the KP15 project, which should give you a really big hint right there. 
Uh, and if you want to go ahead and show the next photo there. Um, he's also co-leader of K1N, the Navassa Island expedition. And it's another, none other than K4UEE, Bob Alfin. And he's our special guest tonight. And we're going to be talking to Bob all about, you guessed it, Navassa. Hey, Bob, welcome aboard. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good evening, Val. I, I, I'm just taken by the difference in today's picture and the one you were just showing a moment ago. <laughs> You've aged just a little bit, but I can still tell it's you. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Not much um, different. Yeah. Well, Navassa is a very highly anticipated de-expedition coming up in the next couple of weeks for those of you who don't know. And so that's why we kind of brought Bob on here. And Bob, one of the first things I want to ask you is when and why did you decide on Navassa Island for your de-expedition? Well, I probably first got interested in uh, getting a permit to go to KP1, which is Navassa Island, about 1999. So about 15 years ago. At that point, it had not been on the air since 1992. Um, now it's been, well, I guess, what, uh, almost 15, 16, 17 years, 20-something years since it's been on the air. And it is the one DXCC entity that has been off the air for the longest time. Uh, depending on which, um, which uh, survey you look at, it's either the number one or the number two rarest uh, among the DXCC entities. So I got interested about 15 years ago. In 2002, several of us who had all been working independently to try to get permission from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, came together and formed the KP-15 project. We had some success. It took us seven years to get permission to operate from Desicheo, which is KP-5, and then after that, another four years, actually five, to get permission for Navassa. So why am I interested in it? Why are DXers interested in it? Is because it's the rarest of the rare. So, I mean, it sounds like you've been working on this for quite some time. Um, what's all involved in trying to get uh, special permission to get on these deserted islands like Navassa? Well, these, these islands and... Um, other top DXCC entities, the rarest of the rare, are rare for a reason. It's usually a, uh, a reason where they are, uh, there's a political reason. Uh, for example, North Korea has not been activated in some time. It's quite rare. Uh, that would be a political reason. In the case of uh, Navassa, it's also political in that the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has control over access to Navassa. Um, the others that you'll find uh, in the top 10 most wanted are usually islands that are just hard to get to, typically uninhabited. They're usually in the Pacific somewhere or maybe in the Antarctic region. So now before you guys set foot on Navassa, I mean, since you've been working on this so long, how many man hours would you say that you and the team have put into Navassa before you even set foot on the island? Well, again, we've been working on uh, this for about 15 years. There's really no way to add them up, but it's got to be uh, among the three or four of us that have worked on this for so long, several thousand uh, man hours. That's in, that's crazy. That's just crazy. Now, how do you guys plan to get on the island? I heard it's kind of difficult to get on that island. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is. It's uh, it's surrounded by cliffs. Uh, the, probably the lowest cliff would be 40 to 60 feet. The highest cliff about about 80 feet, something like that. The entire island is surrounded by these cliffs. So really the way fish and wildlife gets there when they're going to do uh, the work that they do, um, uh, they use helicopters. And frankly, that's what we're gonna do as well. We will also have an offshore vessel that will have supplies for us that we will attempt to land those supplies. But the bulk of uh, all, all the operators and the basic infrastructure and radios and tents and food and, and water that we're going to take with us will all come via helicopter. You know, that doesn't sound exactly cheap. I mean, how much is it going to cost to put on this de-expedition to Navassa? I hope everybody's sitting down. The, uh, 
the budget for this is three hundred and fifty three thousand dollars. Oh my God! Yeah, that, that's uh, incredible. I, we can elevate uh, probably say about two hundred thousand of that uh, is the cost of the fourteen heli helicopter round trips uh, coming from Jamaica. Um, if we need more, uh, the cost is thirty seven hundred and fifty dollars per hour, and it's a two and a half hour round trip. So that's a lot of money. Uh, the payoff is that we are taking enough equipment and enough operators that will be on the island long enough to make uh, many QSOs, uh, many, many QSOs, uh, hopefully 100,000 or so. Um, and it'll be, we'll be concentrating on those hams uh, who do not have a QSO uh, for Navassa, and we're hoping to give them all an all-time new one. It's been actually 22 years since it's been on the air, and they've told us, Fish and Wildlife, they said it'll be at least 10 more years. So this is kind of a once-in-a-32-year opportunity to uh, make a contact with Navassa. So all that 300 some thousand dollars where's all that money coming from? Well, typically, and in this case, about half the money is put up by the operators themselves. There's 15 of us, and everybody has put up over $10,000 to be part of this team. And in addition uh, to the $10,000 that they've all put into the pot, so to speak, they've got to pay their transportation costs, uh, their hotels, uh, their, uh, uh, their uh, food, and uh, all those other expenses that are incurred before they get on the helicopter. Once they're on the helicopter, then the, the kitty, the, the expedition uh, budget picks up and takes care of the expenses. So when you add it all up, it's uh, twelve dollars or $13,000 from each of these 15 men. The rest of the money comes from uh, uh, DX uh, uh, organizations, foundations like Northern Cal, that's NCDXF, Northern Cal DX Foundation, or INDEXA, which is the International DX Association, or DX Clubs. Uh, but frankly, the most of it, uh, other than what's contributed by the operators, comes from individual DXers who want to help out. And interestingly, that average donation is about $50. Well, I always try well, and support uh, local de-expeditions that are going on and helping them out before the de-expedition happens, because that's when they need the money the most. Now, speaking of operators, how many operators are you going to have on the island, and how many stations are you going to have active on Navassa? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we're going to have 15 operators. Uh, we will be on the island about two weeks, and we've got 10 radios. Our objective is to have six or seven on the air 24-7. I think probably at the maximum we'll have eight of those stations on the air. We've got uh, more than a dozen antennas, and basically uh, the operators are going to be operating 12 hours a day in three-hour shifts uh, for the entire uh, duration of the operation. This is not this is not a, a trip to the beach uh, <laughs> or the sunny Caribbean. This is hard, hard work. So are you going to be on all bands and all modes? All bands, 160 through 6, and most of those stations will be 500-watt stations. So if anybody that's listening wants to donate or help out, what's the best way they can do that? Well, probably the easiest way, Val, is to go to our website, which is wwwkp one 5 Dot com, that's kp1-5.com, and click on one of the donate buttons. Uh, this would facilitate a PayPal or a credit card transaction, or you can mail a check to uh, NA5U, that's November Alpha 5 Uniform. Um, and uh, frankly, we would appreciate any support that we can, uh, that we can get from you all. Now, is this going to be tax deductible? Well, it can be. If the, one of the options you have is to make that donation through the Northern California DX Foundation, NCDXF, and if you will indicate on that uh, on that check that you want that contribution to assist the Na the Navassa D expedition, uh, that would make the, your contribution tax deductible. So. Um, when is, I know Jerry's getting packed all ready to go, and um, I'm just curious, when is everybody uh, leaving for Navassa, and when do you hope to be on the air? Good question, and by the way, tell Jerry hello. 
he's, he's a- tell him that we've got a lot of work planned for him. Uh, <laughs> we have, uh, and he, he, I'm sure he knows that. We have two members that are already en route. Uh, one of our members from California has already flown and is aboard the vessel, our support vessel. We have another team member coming from Hungary who is also uh, now in the States and on the support vessel. But the rest of us will be meeting uh, at our staging point in Jamaica next Wednesday. So a week from today, uh, we will all meet up. And then hopefully within a matter of a few days, we'll begin the shuttle flights to the island. All right, so I'm sure this question is on a lot of people's mind. You probably get asked this a lot, but it sure seems like you guys who go on these expeditions put a lot of personal time and personal expense into going to these rare islands. And they don't seem like sometimes there's all that pleasant of an experience with the weather conditions and the, the terrain. And so I'm just curious, why do you do what you do? You know, that's a very good question, and it just happens to be the same question that wa- my my wife asks me often. <laughs> uh, I suppose that the answer is that I've always had, uh, I guess what you'd call a wanderlust. Um, my dad was in the military, and we traveled quite a bit when I was growing up, and, you know, I'm used to traveling. I'm anxious to see what's on the other side of the mountain or the other side of the ocean, and this uh, this hobby, ham radio, has given me an opportunity to visit 124 DXCC countries so far. And frankly, I have wonderful memories of each and every one. And hopefully there'll be time for me to visit many, many more. Well, thanks a lot for joining us tonight. Hopefully you'll get your 11th de-expedition of the year for this one. Bob, I know you put a lot of man hours and work and a lot of money into this. And uh, I really appreciate you joining me tonight. I know you have a lot of packing to do, so I'm going to let you go. And uh, thanks a lot. You're my hero. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, Val. (laughs) I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. Bye-bye now. All right. 73 and 88. <laughs> and I'll say uh-huh. hi to Jerry. Now, if anybody out there wants to join, um, if you want to go ahead and show that one slide, uh, Vic, uh, it, it, this kind of lists the websites you can go to. And you can learn all about the Navassa de Expedition. You can learn about the team. They have propagation charts, band plans that are going on. And also, when you're out there working uh, K1N, also the Echo Papa 6 Tango that's out there right now. As a matter of fact, that's why I'm kind of shuffled off into a new um area jerry's in my normal spot for ham nation he's trying to work echo papa six tango on 80 meters right now before he heads off for his de-expedition but make sure you got your split button on uh don't tune up on the frequency and above all make sure you listen these are rare de-expeditions and uh, we want everybody to have an opportunity to get in the logs and the best way to do that is to uh uh, follow the DX code of conduct. So that's all I have for tonight. I really don't have any DX report. I know we were kind of going to go long here with Bob. So, and uh, I was glad to do it because this Navassa Island thing is a, uh, it's pretty much probably going to be a once in a lifetime thing for any of us out there listening. Uh, this is your, probably your only chance to get them. So uh, make sure you get everything ready and hopefully uh, I'll see you guys in the pileups on K1N. So right now I'm going to head it over to a word from one of my favorite manufacturers, ICOM. Looking for a new rig that combines time-honored analog functionality with the ability to give you safe, hands-free operation via optional Bluetooth module? Check out ICOM's new IC2730A. This dual-band analog-only mobile has a great interface and enhanced radio features for your next 2-meter, 70-centimeter adventure. ICOM's IC2730A is built military tough and has a large high-contrast display, approximately one and a half times larger than its predecessor, the IC2728. It's got a white backlight for easy readability and independent band controls. Practical 2730A features include wide frequency coverage, VHF, VHF, and UHF, UHF simultaneous receive capability, 50 watts output power on VHF and UHF bands, and 1,052 memory channels. You can combine the IC2730's classic analog functionality with optional Bluetooth compatibility. For hands-free and remote control operation, install the optional VS3 Bluetooth headset and UT133 Bluetooth unit. Wirelessly control the radio with three programmable buttons plus a push-to-talk button. Make sure you visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on the IC2730A dual bander and other great ICOM amateur radio rigs.
You can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to iconamerica.com slash Ham Nation and register to win great swag prizes like uh, T-shirts or hats. And while you're there, learn how you can win the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. Sign up, good luck, and don't forget to follow iComAmerica.com on Facebook and Twitter. And the grand prize for February is going to be the new IC2730A dual-band analog mobile with a great user interface and enhanced radio features that we just saw. A military-tough construction, large high-contrast display, 50 watts on both VHF and UHF, plus the optional Bluetooth compatibility for hands-free and remote operation. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this episode and every episode and register to win. And now let's bring in Amanda and see what's been going on in the chat room tonight. Hi, Amanda. Hey, good evening, everybody. Oh, boy. Uh, what a great show. And uh, learning all about de-expeditions, I got to say, I have never actually worked one of those way out, hard to reach de-expeditions. So I'm really hoping Val is going to give us some uh, tips and uh tricks to that one of these days um i know she she helps pilot a couple of them and this time around val is that correct you're going to be the social media for the k1n that's correct that's correct i've just been really busy so i couldn't take on a regular pilot role this year so i'm the social media <laughs> advisor or pilot so uh, uh that's that's uh, a much easier role i guess I, I agree. Um, it sounds like the pilots really have their work cut out for them. Uh, give us a rundown of what a pilot actually does. Well, you're sort of the um, e-hub between the de-expedition team and all the ham radios operator there around the world. I mean, they're going to email you, say, uh, a de-expedition's missing an opportunity. Uh, there's an opening on 10 meters to Northern Europe and they're missing it, you know, they're going to let me know and I'm going to let the team know. Um, and the team's also going to let me know, say they had a storm, take down their uh, uh, 160 vertical. And so they no longer have 160. I'm going to get the word out, you know? So it, it's just, I'm, I'm the communication control tower, so to speak. Oh, I, I do understand, and I could, uh, I could see how that would be really, really hard. So because you have some experiences, I'm going to give you a couple more questions here. And Don and George, if I'm ignoring you, too bad, because there's some cool de-expeditions out there right now. So Carry uh, on. Gotta, no, this is, this is gripping, gripping. I love this we, stuff. No, please, I, I'm by all serious. means. I'm serious. We've got to go over this stuff because, first of all, okay, everybody knows Epo. Oh, Epo, uh, Echo Papa Six Tango is out there right now, and they're kind of yeah. I know it's a, a hard to get island, but they are kind of on a resort island. But none, none the difference. They're asking people, could you please show a little bit more respect and please follow our operators' um, instructions? Um, what what are some of the biggest problems facing them right now, Val? And how could we help them? as individual operators trying to work them, how can we make it better for them? Because it sounds like they're having a few issues right now. Well, the number one rule is to follow the DX code of conduct. If you just Google DX code of conduct, it's going to come up. Um, the behavior lately, it seems, and it's it's more prevalent on sideband for some reason, is out of control. And, and so just follow the DX code of conduct. Please don't tune up on the frequency. If they're asking for North America only, please only call them if you're North America or if they're asking for Europe only or whatever they're asking for. Uh, listen, 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 please obey. It just takes that much longer for them to work one guy. I mean, if everybody were to listen, they could be doing two, 300 an hour. Uh, but these, then there's intentional QRMers and there's nothing that can be done about that. Um, so, I mean, above all, it's mostly listen, 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 make sure, sure your split button's on. Make sure you don't tune up on frequency and listen. Those are the three major rules in order to, to get, get these pileups under control. It, and these guys are having some real no, noise issues. Um, as I'm sure you can guess, 
uh, um, the electricity or the power in some of these countries is not as good as around here. So they have some noise issues, and I know they've been struggling with that, So especially on the low bands. Um, they're really struggling to hear North America. So um, it, it really pays, and it, it, it gets everybody in the log. If everybody can be courteous and listen and wait for your turn and... You know, that's all. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> ranting. <laughs> no, no, I, I completely understand. I have listened to some of these operations already. I was thinking, I don't know how a single operator gets through, honestly. But um, for us, okay, so the on-season DXer that's trying for this for the first time, what do you suggest? What are the best bands from North America? Let's start there. And CW or SSB? I'm guessing CW, but what do you think? What what are our best tactics to try to break through to these guys? You know, I'm, I'm, I know it's probably harder for me because I'm a YL and, and they, when I was on the other side of the pile up, when I went to Saba, the YLs just plow right through a sideband pile up and you can Definitely. hear them. It, it, it makes a big difference. You have a 10 dB gain there, right there. But I always try to find a frequency. A lot of my, I've had 284 countries right now, but over 200 of them, I worked with my 100 watts on a tri-bander when I lived in Wisconsin, not from this super station here. And the way I did it, I was, I would find it, I would go somewhere in the middle where there was nobody else transmitting. So I'd be all by myself and I would get through. And I know I'm a YL, but it seems to work when you're all by yourself. I don't go to the zeros or the fives or any of those even numbers where everybody's at. I kind of go off by myself because when you're on the other side of the pileup and, and it's just 5,000 guys coming at you at once, all you hear is noise. So if you're all by yourself, you might have a better chance. The later on in the de-expedition you go, the better chance you have to work them too. Um, if you're a QRP or, you know, a barefoot kind of guy um, or gal. So that would be my advice for you. A CW, I'm, I'm, I rarely work CW. Sometimes I do. I'm so slow on CW. It's just really hard for me. Um, so I really can't give advice for that. Same here. Um, I would, first of all, I would never respond to them in a, a speed that they could uh, deal with. They'd be like, what? <laughs> speed up. Okay. So uh, yeah, I understand that completely. Other than that, listening to CW pileups is ridiculous, but thank you. Those are some really great points. I really appreciate that. I've always, uh, one of these days I I'm hoping to work echo Papa six tango. That's my first goal. And then it will be K one in. Um, and I hope Jerry is going to have a good time out there. Hey, by the way, um, so what are they expecting? What what bands you you'd already discussed what bands are going to be on all bands, all modes. Um what what do you really honestly think their first day is going to be? Well, usually most de expeditions, I can't speak for K1N because we didn't go into details, but most de expeditions, they try and get a couple things up right away. Sometimes they'll go in and do them all at once and everybody, it's just on all bands, all modes, you know, and just do a blitz kind of thing. But most of the time they at least get a couple antennas up and a couple guys on the radio going right away. Um, usually the, the 20s and the 40s and the 15s are the major bands. Um, and then 80 and 160 usually comes a day or two later. So uh, look for that. Probably, I can't, you know what, I don't know, but... Just going off experience, that seems to be the norm. Um, I would guess you probably hear guys on 20 and 40 sideband and CW right away. Riddy usually comes in two or three days later once the pileups, well, the pileups never dwindle on some things like this. Um, but uh, usually you don't see Riddy till usually the third or fourth day, just based on priority expeditions that I've piloted. Okay. Well, very good. Thanks so much for your insight, Val. That's what we're really looking for there. We just want to get that little extra tip to help us uh, get a little bit further. So. And for you, you know what I want to say too, for you generals out there, you're usually not going to hear them. You know, when these guys are on the other end of a pileup and it's just a huge, massive pileup, one way to control the pileup, unfortunately, is to start out in the extra class bands. So for you generals out there, just be patient. They usually will go up to the general class bands in week two once the pileups are a little more manageable. And that's just really an only way for they can at least pick out a couple letters in a call sign in their pileups. So generals, be patient. They'll probably be with you in week two. 
that and that brings up a really great question that I forgot to ask. So before I've seen that they might be listening or no, wait it. They're talking in 70, 85, let's say, and they're listening up 100. And I couldn't even fathom a split like that. That actually happens. Is that correct? Yeah, because when they go on these other islands, they're allowed to transmit on sideband below uh, where we are in North America. So you might see that they're spotted way out of the North American frequency for sideband, but they're just listening to you. They're just transmitting there and they want you to transmit, say, on 7240. So you're allowed to work them because you're only listening below our band privileges. That's that's great. Awesome. Uh, I just I never had heard about that before. And I saw somebody saying that they were up 100. I thought, no, that's going to be a mistake. So, hey, Val, some great information tonight. And thanks so much for uh, uh, getting your friend on there to talk about K1N. Uh, we're really excited for him to get on the air. Yeah, then Bob Alfin's a rock star as far as the expeditions go. Uh, he's the guy in my book anyway. Um, he's just a great guy and uh, a really good friend. And I'm glad I could get him on. I know those guys are busy. So hopefully you guys will give him a break and make sure your split's on and make sure you don't tune up on frequency and listen. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Val, so much. And I appreciate that. And hey, um, you know what, George, Don, all I can say is, I'm sorry, it was ladies night. And uh, Mr. Don, nice to see you tonight. And uh, thanks for being on. And hey, Skeeter, helping out with uh, uh, Amateur Radio Newsline, that's the coolest. Can't believe that. Go ahead. Skeeter's a good guy. And uh, we're trying to get Newsline back on just as soon as we possibly can. And, And more importantly, we're trying to get Bill Pashenek out of the hospital just as soon as we possibly can. You know, this getting old, uh, the, the, you know, he's been doing it. He did this for 37 years continuously without a break and without fail. So, you know, to, to, to take a little hiatus now, I think he's earned it. And, and plus, you know, he's, none of us are getting any older. And this, 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 this getting older, it, it ain't for kids. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> oh, well, okay. I'm oh, sorry. I the guys are getting of, older. I the guys are getting older. The, the ladies are just getting more beautiful. Yeah. See, I, think, oh. I know how to dig. I've been married That's for 30 so years. I know how to dig myself out of a hole. <laughs> Boy, she's... Don is so sweet to you, Don. I can't I can't tell you. Okay. Anyhow, I was thinking of staging a breakout for uh, Mr. Pasternak. I think that would be fun. No, you guys don't listen to that. Okay. Um, anyhow, that's all I've got for tonight. Great show. Lovely. Bob got on. Gordo. Burning sand ham, you guys. How much did you think of that? That was cool. Yeah. Okay. So they added a little bit of lighter fluid, but um, still. And if yeah, that was why you see the guy blow up. Yeah, me too, right? <laughs> and I was thinking, wow. And somebody said, so tomorrow there's going to be a fire in Yuma. Who do we call? Um, oh, boy. <laughs> Please don't let that happen. No, I think I think they have it fully under control with Gordo at the reins. Um, no, you guys, that was fun. Anyhow, they were really looking forward to that for Ham Nation tonight. So I'm glad that they were on. Anyhow, yep. you guys going to let you close up the show here. I know we're running a little bit late. And Victor, thank you so much for wonderful Ham Nation tonight. You did uh, great behind the scenes there. So, George, you take it away. Send it to uh, Val or uh, Don, whoever you need to. Go ahead. You guys, good night. 73. All right. Yeah, great show tonight. Had a good time. And I look forward to seeing everyone again next week when Bob and Gordo will be back in their home bases there. So, Don, Back to you to wrap it, my friend. Sounds good to me. Yeah, we've uh, we've had a good show tonight. I mean, a lot of really great information. We've had the uh, the live remote from uh, from Quartz Fest. We had uh, the great information on Navasa and uh, a, a lot of good information on on DXing. I've <clears throat> I've only worked one, and that was the one I can't even remember the call sign of. But it was over in in Africa somewhere. And oh, and, you're uh, killing me. And who did I, who did I who did who was my contact over there? Who did I talk to? Oh, Ray Novak. Oh, oh, Ray, Ray, Ray Novak. Ray. Oh, Zimbabwe. Or wait. Yeah. That's, no, Mozambique. Yeah. Mozambique. Yeah, Mozambique. Yeah. Mozambique. Yeah. Mozambique. It was Mozambique, yeah. And Ray Novak was the guy I talked to. I'm like, my God, I talk all the way across the world and it's you? But that's all right. <laughs> Ray's, a, Ray's a good guy. And I, in fact, and I never did send off for my card. I wonder if I can still do that one of these days. <gasps> I know. You I'm, can I'm, go to OQRS on Club Log, I'm sure, and get that. 
Yeah, right. I, probably so would many, I had so many other questions about uh, QS. Okay, so I'm just going to send this out because somebody wanted to know how do you get your bureau card so fast? Uh, Val, go oh, ahead. these are not fast. Oh, well, hang on, let me pull it. I mean, I got a lot of QSL cards to write. Okay, let me pull a couple out here. This one is from March 30th, 2014. So it's 10 months old. That's not bad. March 29th, March. A lot of these are from March of last year. So yeah, the DX bad. contest in um uh, yeah the bureau's kind of a slow boat, um just get ready you're gonna get a lot of German cards because they can use the bureau for free, so oh. and they do, <laughs> let me tell you, um yeah. but it's kind of fun to see all these cards from everybody around the world and all the notes they write so um I agree. Just, Make sure you yep. stock up on QSL cards once you start contesting. That's all I have to Absolutely. say. Absolutely, I'm going to be. You busy. know the the whole the whole uh, the whole the whole bureau. That sounds like a perfect segment for another night because we are running late, and uh, that that's yep. a that's a great. The, the bureau is a is a great thing. So uh, let's talk Take about the nets. There, we have Bill. after show. We have after show nets. We have uh, the Ham Nation uh, wiki. Uh, you can. That's a great resource. You got to go uh, Dan Van Evenhoven that uh, takes care of that. Uh, Wiki.twit.tv uh, slash wiki slash ham underscore nation. Go and check that out. And where are the nets tonight besides uh, Echo Link uh, on the uh, uh, star do drop in star and, uh, and besides D star on uh, 14 Charlie? Who has those frequencies? Okay. And uh, the Echo Link is also, if you're calling in on a repeater, punch yeah. in 355-800. Uh, the 40-meter net is going to be on 7.278. Uh, Cheryl is going to be on 80 meters at 3.847 megahertz. And the 20-meter net, it may be closed now. It was open a few moments ago on 14.268 megahertz. I listened and couldn't hear it here, but might give it a shot. But uh, that's this week's frequencies. Good. Awesome. Great show. Thanks to uh, to everybody for being a part of it. And thanks to you for watching and participating in the, in the chat room. We appreciate you. You're the reason why we do this for, what, 180 shows now and counting. So we'll see you guys next week here on Ham Nation. Good night, everybody. 7-3.